Black sorry, leader. Sorry to, to, uh, to oh, okay. break Hi. in. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hi. Hope, hope everyone is doing well uh, today. Uh, for this, uh, this sorry is to, the. Sorry to, uh, oh. This is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and uh, I'm coming to you from uh, uh, Georgiage, uh, which has long been a meeting place of various uh, First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. And um, there's a, a number of uh, uh, interesting developments in Canadian foreign policy in uh, recent days that I thought I would uh, discuss, and then we can have a... Uh, a wide ranging uh, discussion uh, uh, after that. Uh, I thought I'd begin with the contrast, the protests in Iran versus Haiti. And of course, there has been a, a month long uprising in Haiti. Today, there's major, major demonstrations. Uh, again, uh, they've sort of ebbed and flowed a little bit, but certainly in the past. Uh, two weeks now, there have been really massive demonstrations or last week, the week before last, it was quite, quite massive demonstrations. There's also been a protest over the past week or so uh, in, in Iran. And um, the contrast with how the media attention, the political attention to Iran versus Haiti is quite remarkable. Uh, you have uh, the House of Commons unanimously passing a resolution in, in solidarity with the protests in Iran. You have uh, NDP foreign affairs critic Heather McPherson tweeting out four times about the protests in Iran, having released a, uh, a, a press release about in solidarity the protests in Iran. Nothing from Heather McPherson about the protests in Haiti. To my knowledge, there hasn't been any MP that has said anything about the protests in Haiti. The protests in Haiti, this is a country where we have a lot of influence. It's actually, they're protesting the, the leader that we have put in place, that Canada, the US and a couple others have put in place, that they're calling for him to go. Uh, it's a Canadian funded, trained, armed, uh, diplomatically backed police force that's killed a number of protesters in recent days in Haiti, uh, including a really horrific incident where they shot at press reporter. And then when the reporter cried out that they were press. A police officer went over and shot the reporter on video in the stomach at point blank range. Uh, nothing, nothing from, from what I found, certainly not from Heather McPherson. I looked at her Twitter for the, more than a month, nothing about Haiti. And as far as I know, not other, other uh, MPs haven't said anything either. Of course, the media coverage is, is, is very different too. The Iran protests front page of the Globe and Mail on Wednesday. Uh, on the national, the Haiti protests, very, very little coverage. To the extent there is coverage, CBC did do a story, and it was from Evan Dyer, who, who, who has actually just, his previous story in Haiti was pretty good, so he kind of has a certain understanding of what's going on. But the whole structure of the story, well, it was gangs. As if these, like, protests with tens and tens of thousands of people all across the country protests as if this is just gangs that are doing this. It is completely shocking how much the whole uh, media frame, to the extent there isn't, they even bother to frame the protests, they frame it around gangs are out of control. There is no doubt there is a gang problem in Haiti and Pohol Plain specifically, but in Haiti more generally, uh, there's a lot to say about that issue that I'm not going to get into, um, as Jean Saint-Ville said on a you know, previous uh, episode of the for, uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. But um, these are mass protests demanding a Canadian-backed leader that has literally no, no legitimacy, uh, constitutional legitimacy for him to go. Uh, and, uh, and the media and the political class just, just ignore it. Whereas in, in, in Iran, now... Obviously, women being forced to veil is something that I disagree with, of course. Uh, but the, the context of what's going on in Iran is also vicious American sanctions, a clear desire on the part of uh, Israel, important elements within the US to, to destabilize the government in Iran. And very likely there is um, some uh, direct stoking 
of the protests in Iran by Washington. Certainly there's indirect stoking by the, the, the sanctions campaign that have, have really weakened the Iranian uh, economy and lots of, of course, grievances among Iranians on that, on that issue. Um, so you really see when you, when, you, when you take a broad lens of how the political and media establishment works on different international issues, you can't compare. I mean, the, the, the protests in Haiti have been going on for longer. They're, they're, they're bigger in character. Uh, there's been probably about as many people have been killed, even though the country is, you know, on a per capita basis, way more people have been killed in Haiti. Uh, again, Canadian funded and trained police that are doing that killing, that our ambassador is literally boasting about sending $40 million to support this year. That's our ambassador boasting about that recently. Um, so, so it, it really is telling about how the political and media uh, system works um, in what, you know, what's viewed as a, a protest movement that's deserving of attention and solidarity and what movement is, is, is uh, not deserving of, of solidarity and attention. And the one that tends to target, you know, tends to be anti-imperialist and that tends to target Canadian uh, power structures, uh, that is the one that gets, uh, that gets ignored. And we're seeing that play out in a very aggressive way uh, a, a, as we speak. Now on Haiti, there's a number of developments. Canadian government is really taking this seriously. This week in, when he was in New York, Trudeau uh, held a meeting, a conference to bring together countries to talk about Haiti. Uh, Trudeau uh, really became a uh, anti-imperialist, anti-corporate uh, 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 figure uh, in his statement. Uh, he said that, uh, he said that outside elements, quote, outside elements can't determine the future of Haiti. And he denounced the elites and oligarchs who contribute to instability. So, so we have a, you know, a, a, an anti-imperialist socialist prime minister in Haiti or in, in Ottawa that, about what's going on in Haiti. And of course, he said nothing about Canada withdrawing from the core group uh, of the outside imperial forces that are dictating to Haiti. And he, of course, said nothing about Canada ending its support for the PHTK uh, political uh, regime that is, of course, uh, supported by the and tied into the oligarchs in Haiti um, that we've been supporting now for more than a, more than a decade. Um, nevertheless, it's always good to have, uh, at least at the rhetorical level, Justin Trudeau is very good at this uh, this this rhetoric that's uh, nice sounding when the policies don't uh, don't. Uh, uh, fit the bill. Uh, this is a pretty extreme uh, example of that. They also had a, a meeting with the Americans on Friday where there was a joint statement by the U.S. and Canada about Haiti uh, and the basket fund, which the Canadian government set up uh, to help fund the Haitian police and Canada put in 10 million UN, UN um, uh, initiative uh, that Canada's launched uh, to fund the police. And uh, and uh, uh, there's also actually right now, or just a little while ago, I don't know if it's done yet, but um, a couple hours ago, an hour and a half ago, so there's a UN Security Council discussion of Haiti. And the American official is in Paul Prince uh, today um, uh, to push forward. It looks like the possibility of, 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 of UN uh, intervention is, is seriously uh, on the table. Um, so, so it really is, you know, the, this is this is a top concern of the Canadian government. What's going on in Haiti, and the concern is, of course, that the masses are mobilizing. That they are, uh, quite frankly, on, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's got to get to this, but they are pillaging, they are looting, and the oligarchs and the wealthy of Haiti are concerned by that, and the you know traditional. A, a foreign imperial powers are also uh, uh, troubled by the uh, loss of control uh, uh, of the country. Uh, as on one level, as hard as it is to believe, but that is what the Canadian government is, is I think, uh, primarily uh, worried about uh, right now uh, with regards to, to Haiti. Uh, shifting gears, the maple had a very good story, maybe the best story I've seen about Canada's role in Afghanistan uh, over the past you know, two decades, um, that uh, it's titled The Truth About Canada's Involvement in Afghanistan. What I found very interesting about it is it, it to, as far as I know, I hadn't seen this before, I can't remember seeing this. Uh, it talks about Canada's support for the, uh, the Mujahideen in the late 70s, early through, you know, through the 1980s, and Canada supporting Reagan 
and that whole process of of um, of fighting the the Soviets, and of course that you know turns into Al Qaeda and and Bin Laden and and all of that, and uh, so it goes back and shows Canada sending weapons, providing uh, diplomatic support, uh, which was definitely an article worth uh, worth checking out. Uh, in Guatemala, there was a, a local uh, a municipal referendum in uh, Asuncion Mita, a small uh, community, where 88% of participants voted against uh, met metallic mining in their, um, in their area. And immediately the Canadian company that is exploring uh, bluestone resources said it's illegal uh, so did the Guatemalan government. Probably the Canadian government is involved in lobbying on the issue. There was a report that came out about uh, six, eight months ago that just showed the scope of Canadian lobbying uh, for mining companies in Guatemala. Just remarkable scope, how much attention the Global Affairs Canada and uh, the ambassador and the embassy officials and the Canadian officials at the Organization of American States and this really massive lobbying campaign over a Canadian mining company that was being pursued at the Organization of American States, having a, a court case uh, uh, leveled against it. And just the scope of Canadian um, uh, diplomatic support. It's about a decade ago. Uh, there's no reason to believe that things have you know, fundamentally uh, changed with regards to the prioritization of mining by Canadian diplomats in, uh, in Guatemala. There was a story on um, a Canadian dimension uh, titled uh, Gustavo Petro's environmental protection plans face, face pushback from extractive companies. And it talks about the new leftish, leftish president trying to have you know, more sensible uh, mining policies and how there's a pushback. And in the story, it mentions something that's a, a something that you know is a really remarkable uh, a case of, um, of of what Canada's foreign policy and, and specifically aid policy is about, and is writing countries' mining codes. And it talks about quotes the uh, head of the Labor Federation in, in Colombia saying that the mining code in Colombia was something that Canada initiated and at the interests of, uh, at the expense of local communities, at the interests of foreign multinationals. In the early 2000s, CEDA, the Canadian International Development Agency, spent millions of dollars on rewriting Colombia's mining code. And it was just outrageous what appears in the new mining code. Like the, the royalty rate is like cut by more than 10 times. Uh, the companies are allowed to uh, extract for longer. Uh, it's just a, just a shocking, uh, pro foreign mining company uh, mining code. And that's what our aid dollars were spent uh, in Colombia uh, doing. So that's, you know, Canadian aid policy. And the Colombia example is the most outrageous, but, but and it's written, been written about in, in many places. I've written about it in a few places, but it's been written about in a number of different uh, articles and books. Um, but, but variations of that, generally maybe a little bit less extreme have taken place in countries, multiple countries around the world where Canadian officials shape countries' mining codes uh, and aid money goes to supporting forces that are rewriting the mining codes. And they, they just lo and behold, the rewriting of the mining codes happens to be good for uh, foreign, uh, foreign mining companies with Canada being the preeminent uh, mining power in, in the world. Uh, last week, also, the HMCS Vancouver uh, went through the, uh, with American uh, naval vessel, went through the Taiwan Strait, and uh, Anita Anand boasted about it, Canada's defense minister boasted about it. The next day, the Chinese government uh, uh, criticized Canada's uh, aggressive uh, policy on uh, ratcheting up tensions. So this is, a, this is a sort of recurring, it seems like it's almost a, like a monthly occurrence of Canadian naval vessels through the Taiwan Strait, South China Sea, uh, alongside American and other uh, vessels in ways that are, that are designed to be uh, provocative to, uh, uh, to the Chinese. Also, I think on Thursday, very late Thursday, Anand uh, uh, extended Canada's military mission in, in Iraq for another 12 months. And Canada's had two different military missions in Iraq uh, the one of them goes back, I think it's uh, 2014, 
um, and I think the other one's 2018. Uh, but I, I believe the focus mostly is, is on uh, NATO training. And uh, part of that is a is a is about pushing back against Iranian influence with within within Iraq. Uh, the mission has been whittled down in size. I believe at the high point it was something like about 500 Canadian troops, including significant amount of special forces in Iraq. There's also an announcement. I think it was yesterday that uh, Anand announced that Canada was the, the CBC story titled "Canada Boosts Capacity of of Key Supply Hub." for weapons to Ukraine. And basically the, the uh, base in Scotland where Canada's helping either sending Canadian weapons, I believe also some American weapons and Canadian um, transport aircraft, military transport aircraft are, are then ferrying it into, I believe probably mostly into Poland. It's all a little bit, you know, it's kept a little bit hidden uh, that uh, they're expanding the size of those operations and um, and so that's just a, you know, that's part of this response to uh, Russia, of course, uh, uh, you know, ratcheting up uh, its war in, in Ukraine uh, with regards to the referendums uh, taking place in the east of Ukraine and also with regards to uh, the partial mobilization that, that um, the Russian government announced. And so we're just, we're just this, you know, con continued escalatory kind of dynamic, which, you know, who knows where we're going to go with this. Uh, it's obviously very, very uh, troubling. And um, um, we need to, we need to be pushing back against it. In, uh, in the CBC article, I believe it was on Saturday, uh, from Murray Brewster, he uh, quotes, he's, he's a story about Bob Ray, uh, Canada's uh, ambassador to the UN, uh, pushing for more and more uh, weapons to Ukraine and basically Ray was saying that the Canadian government should just anything that the Ukrainian government asked for we should send to them that was the essence of, of Bob Ray's position and Bob Ray acted like this was going to harm his career you know it might be might be career damaging but I'm you know I would stand out there as a you know principled moral moral person to to push for more weapons being shipped and whatnot well, Murray Brewster's story in, in the CBC, he's the lead military reporter for the CBC. He, his story begins, says, quote, the word hawk and the name Bob Ray are seldom found in the same sentence, except when it comes to Ukraine. I mean, Bob Ray supported bombing Libya. Bob Ray pushed to extend the war in Afghanistan. Bob Ray supported overthrowing the elected government of Haiti. Bob Ray supported Canada's campaign, failed campaign to oust Maduro in Venezuela. Bob Ray has supported decades of Israeli violence against Palestinians. I mean, this is just outright propaganda by Murray Brewster trying to like, like you know, begin this story about Bob Ray taking a hard line on Ukraine. It's like he's been forced into this position when he's, you know, he just wants peace and and non-intervention. And it's just it's just complete, utterly crass effort to just, you know, jingoistic kind of uh uh you know, with for for a CBC audience, of course, for this sort of liberalish kind of uh, uh veneer to it. Uh you know, it's really uh, quite quite astounding to see uh, play out when you know anything about Bob Ray's uh, uh, history, which is you know most outrageously his anti-Palestinian history, right? Bob Ray, you know, ripped up his said he ripped up his NDP membership. He was a former Premier of Ontario, NDP Premier of Ontario, ripped up his NDP membership because of too many voices supporting Palestinian rights within the NDP and and whatnot. And uh, so I thought I flipped to another to the Palestine question. Um, uh, be, before getting to the NDP Palestine question, which is totally fascinating, what's going on there, is the just uh, there have been there were major protests in uh, um, in the West Bank against uh, the Palestinian Authority. There's one image on Twitter of uh, looks like dozens even chucking rocks at a, a Palestinian security force kind of light armored vehicle, vehicle type uh, type thing. And there's a real outrage being targeted by young Palestinians against the Palestinian Authority security forces. The, World, the Wall Street Journal's headline was West Bank militants fight Israel, Palestinian Authority. 
this is this is not new. Of course, this has been going variation you know, of the hostility to Palestinian security forces have you know been been around this for time? quite a few years here. Um, but uh, uh, oh. what is that done? Uh, it doesn't look done. Looks uh, done, but how do I know? Poke it. See if it's sorry there. <laughs> I think I muted everyone. Uh, uh, so. But the but the Canada has played this important role in in um, in building up the Palestinian security force, and, and I'm not going to get into it all because it you know it deserves a real extensive discussion. It's because it is quite fascinating. But tens and tens of millions, probably over 100 million dollars of Canadian aid, has been going to the Palestinian Authority security forces for the past 15 years, with the explicit objective of having a security force. Initially, to combat Hamas, to side with the Palestinian, the Fatah, the Palestinian Authority against Hamas, but more specific, to oversee Israel's occupation of the West Bank, and it's the Shin Bet, the internal Israeli uh, security for uh, int intelligence apparatus that vets the Palestinian security force candidates, and U.S., British, Canadian uh, trainers that train them and uh, and assist them. And, and we have the internal government documents, right? We had the head of uh, uh, CEDA, Margaret Biggs, back in 2012, saying that Israel was campaigning, Canada was threatening to cut off its aid to the Palestinian Authority if it, it pursued this, this statehood bid at the UN. And the Israelis were coming to the Canadian government saying, no, we don't want you to cut off the support to the Palestinian Authority security forces because we see them as serving our interests. And, and they talked, and Margaret Biggs is quoted in this journal file, saying it's about the design to uh, put down popular protests. That's the, you we use the word popular protest on the Palestinian street. Um, so it's really, I mean, it's part of a long history of colonial authorities wanting uh, uh, acquiescent or subservient uh, local populations to do their security work. The British used, you know, it wasn't just British forces in, in India, it was mostly Indians that were overseeing British colonial rule. Israel's no different. It wants, you know, a compliant Palestinians to do its dirty work. What's different in this case is that you have outside forces, the U.S., Canada, and Britain, that are that are uh, overseeing that process. Um, and so this gets me to the to the uh, the question of the NDP in Palestine, and and this is this is heating up. It's very much heating up. Uh, Politico, uh, a couple about an hour and a half ago, Politico, the uh, news website uh, had their in their email one of the top they list three things they're following, and uh, and it's the one is quote and we monitor a burbling dispute between New Democrats and the Jewish community. Very unfortunate uh, framing of of uh, what's going on, uh, but. Um, nevertheless, that is the framing, and of course, it's a uh, center for Israel and Jewish affairs. Uh, framing of, of what's going on. And basically, as I've discussed in previous, about a month ago, on August 26th, Jagmeet Singh sent out an email with 13 demands on Palestine, a significant improvement in NDP policy on Palestine. He did it in a very coy way. It's not on the website, didn't get posted to social media. It was just sent out to members, certain segment, a very small segment of members, presumably pro-Palestinian members that they have on some list. And that bubbled up into a lot of attention by left-wing media and a lot of attention by pro-Palestinian groups. And, and in response to two weeks of, of sort of left-wing and pro-Palestinian attention, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, uh, CJA, put out an action alert, put out a press release condemning it. And then the, the, they have now upped the ante uh, in that condemnation, putting out another action alert uh, to their membership. This is to the CJ membership titled, quote, the first one was pretty bad, but this is really bad. The title of the, of the action alert is, Jagmeet Singh, your Middle East policy is dangerous for Jews. Uh, in, in the, in the uh, action alert, C just calls it ignorant, says that Singh was duped. Um, so they're, they're coming hard now. They're coming hard at... Uh, at, uh, at Singh. And on Tuesday, uh, Singh attended the CJA lobbying session at Parliament Hill for the beginning of, uh, of uh, Parliament setting up. CJA had this 
a, a lobbying session at Parliament Hill, and they got very wide uh, spectrum of the you know power players in Ottawa that that showed up, uh, including Singh. I didn't actually see any. I didn't see any images of of any ND, any other NDP MPs. Uh, though I'm almost certain that Randall Garrison would have been there, uh, but I don't think I saw an image of him. And in the, in this 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 lobbying session, okay. So first of all, it's to celebrate Israel. That's a, the first part. That, which you know, this is an apartheid state that Amnesty, Human Rights Watch have all said is committing the crime of apartheid in recent reports. But specifically, this 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 lobbying session was to celebrate the accord between Morocco and Israel about 21 months ago, for Morocco to restart or to start diplomatic relations with Israel. Well, that accord was something that Donald Trump administration initiated. And it was an explicit quid pro quo where the Americans became the first country to recognize Morocco's rule over Western Sahara. And which has been you know, ruling for almost uh, you know, more than four decades. And, and is the UN calls occupied in exchange for Israel or Morocco beginning relations with, with, uh, with Israel. So this is, a, this is like a really odious, odious uh, Trump, uh, you know, colonial, I mean, open colonial kind of a, accord. And this was what the, 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 the lobbying session was explicitly, it was, uh, I think it was um, uh, Mor uh, Mor uh, Moroccan delights Israeli wine, I think that was the title of the, so it was like Moroccan food and Israeli wine at this lobbying session. Uh, and it's, it, it, in the literature, it's, just, it's totally open about what, what, they're, what they're celebrating. And it was done in conjunction with the Moroccan, uh, uh, the Israeli embassy and the Moroccan embassy. And um, so Singh, of course, you know, he's under pressure. He's being pressed on this issue. And he, this is somebody on, you know, on Palestine, he's a complete wet noodle. He's got no, he flips flops everywhere, depending on, political calculation, pressure, uh, uh, whatever. So Singh attends this, this, um, this, uh, this lobbying session. It's not clear what, you know, they, they, in the tweet that Sija put out about Singh being there, they, they, they frame it that they like gave him a talking to at the, at the thing about his, you know, recent uh, email about Palestine. Uh, also the head of the, uh, the uh, Edmonton Jewish Federation, the Jewish Federations or what, they're the parent organization of Sija. They fund Sija and they oversee Sija. They they publish an op-ed in uh, the Toronto Sun, Edmonton Sun, I think a few other Sun papers, uh, going at uh, Heather McPherson, any before a critic who's viewed as the one who's sort of been pushing the po party in a better policy on Palestine, and they go at uh, Singh's uh, uh, email to the list. So this is this email to the list that like it's like it doesn't exist, right? It just was sent out. I, I, you know, could have been sent. I know two people that received this email with the thirteen demands. But like it could literally only be like 100 people or 50 people that receive the NDP email. But it's now like, you know, taken on this huge, uh, 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 um, you know, life of its own. It's been reported on all kinds of places. See, just claiming in the polit political, they're claiming they had 5,000 people have emailed uh, uh, Singh on their different action alerts in, in recent weeks. Um, uh, so I, I think it's probably the the, the most uh, brouhaha over a, a an email a party sent out on an international issue that was only sent out to a small segment of of their of the party's list that doesn't again doesn't appear on any website wasn't posted on on NDP social media uh, though Heather McPherson did did defend it in in, a, in an interview with the Maple um, but it's. Uh, the issue is picking up, and and so at the same time as this going as this is going on, and maybe even what part of what precipitated the NDP to to uh, put out this thirteen statement in an email, is that there's a call for the NDP to withdraw from the Canada Israel Interparliamentary Group, and I know that it was circulating in NDP circles in the in the time just before Singh sent this email out to the to the list on his new thirteen demands about Palestine. It's possible that. That's part of what preempted uh, this to, to send out because there was way they, it's really difficult for the for them to withdraw from the Canada Israel Interparliamentary Group because Randall Garrison, who's on the executive of that, is you know completely committed. So you know, with anything less than you know kicking him out of the caucus 
it's pretty clear that Randall Garrison won't actually leave the Canada Israel Interparliamentary Group. Um, so, so it's not clear if, if you know that's part of what to try to blunt some of the criticism on that front. They put out the 13 uh, demands. Nonetheless, the the issue is live. It's hot. Uh, 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 very you know for our political climate. Uh, very impressive response from Matthew Green, the NDP MP in Hamilton, to this CJA campaign. He tweeted out say, saying, quote, if CJA thinks running a smear campaign in the Toronto Sun against us will cause us to turn a blind eye to the apartheid regime in Israel, they are, sor they are sorely mistaken, right? Um, so uh, calling it a smear campaign, of course, the pro-Israel types would all say that's, you know, calling it a smear campaign is, is anti-Semitic. Uh, they, they say the actual policies themselves are anti-Semitic and then responding to them to being attacked by that, by calling it, you know, the smear campaign, they would call that a, it's like double anti-Semitism from their, from their standpoint. So, so uh, you know, I think what Matthew Green is doing is a statement of fact, but, but, uh, but for our political climate, that is actually uh, fairly, fairly bold. And of course, the Brian Lilly at, at the Sun News, taught one of the top people at the Toronto Sun, came out hard at Matthew Green for 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 tweeting that. Um, so the issue is 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 live. We'll see what happens in in coming days, but I'm I'm certain that it's gonna uh, it's gonna have some uh, uh, some more uh, more developments, and um, and people should definitely sign that public letter calling for the NDP to withdraw from the Canada Israel Interparliamentary Group, and also CJPME is saying that more than 3,200 people have already uh, sent emails in the last, I think, three days to uh, Singh, uh, calling on him to implement the 13 demands. Don't just put it in some, some uh, quiet email, uh, but actually start you know, putting it forward uh, 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 more aggressively. And um, I'll uh, you know, take people's uh, comments and uh, questions about, uh, about whatever topic. And I think I figured out, I can see that Yuri has his hand up, so I think I figured out the uh, the whole hand question. Go ahead, Yuri. Perfect, perfect. Uh, great talk as always, uh, Eve. Uh, I think the first thing I wanted to ask you about was, so you said that the Maypole uh, actually uh, went very deep into Afghanistan's role in Af uh, Canada's role in Afghanistan. Not, and in, in other words, history didn't just start with the uh, NATO uh, invasion in response supposedly to 9-11, but that actually Canada did support the Mujahideen and did support the uh, reactionary uh, movement against the uh, communist uh, government of Afghanistan, right? Yep. So in that same article, be, uh, did they talk at all about the fact that uh, Canada, you know, de facto supports uh, ISIS, uh, ISIS's attempts to overthrow the uh, Assad uh, secular government in uh, Syria because uh, uh, WikiLeaks uh, documents uh, related to Hillary Clinton's emails and of course other investigative journalists have exposed that Canada, uh, the West, the US, Brits and so forth do support uh, ISIS and other reactionary Islamists attempt to overthrow Assad as well as what happened in uh, Libya, the Gulf states and the Western uh, States. And I'm curious if, if, if the Maple article talked at all about that. I don't believe so. I don't believe it talked about it, didn't, didn't link, link things. Uh, with regards to Libya, we, we you know, the military, uh, David Puglesi at the Ottawa Citizen reported on uh, Canadian fighter jet uh, pilots joking about how they were Al Qaeda's um, uh, Air Force during the bombing of Libya, right? So that was reported on. They, they had the uh, you know, and, and they had also Canadian military intelligence reports from just before uh, early 2011, when there was the you know uprising against Gaddafi, that that uh, that talk about that the the opposition is you know sort of Islamist jihadist type forces, and that by by um, that the likely scenario would be sort of you know strengthening their hand by. Um, you know, weakening Gaddafi. Uh, and clearly with regards to, as you, you know, Canada's policy on Syria was very much aligned with American policy that was, uh, you know, aligned with uh, supporting um, uh, ISIS, ISIS type, uh, type forces. 
but no, no, they don't, they didn't, in the, I don't believe, I don't remember that they linked that at all in the Maple story. But. And then two quick, uh, and, then, and then two other quick questions is, uh, regards to, uh, with, with, with regards to uh, Israel, it's funny, I was actually re-watching an interview I did with uh, Gideon uh, Levy of uh, Haaretz, uh, which is, which which is bad mostly on Israel Palestine, but it's one of the only places where they allow liberal Zionist forces and anti-war uh, voices in their uh, newspaper. It's kind of like the Guardian of Israel, but but uh, but you know it's so weird uh, when 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 the Israel lobby launches their uh, their smear campaigns and cries anti-Semitic this, anti-Semitic that. Uh, even when, the, even when most, even when most of the people who speak out against Israel, like Noam Chomsky, he's from a Jewish uh, background. Aaron Matze, <laughs> even his own father, Doctor, uh, you know, you know, Doctor Matze, all are, all are, are ah, they're all of a Jewish background. The same thing with most of the people who were, who were slandered as anti-Semites in uh, Britain when Jeremy Corbyn was leader. Most of them were Jewish anti-Zionist voices. So is 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 anyone from the uh, NDP at least you know saying excuse me uh, we're not we're not anti semites because look independent Jewish voice for peace supports us look there's this rabbi that supports us <laughs> so can you stop yeah. with the stupid anti semitism uh, you know yeah, card but it, or but it, but it, the problem is is, is, is it's kind of like the whole you know the historic. Uh, um, uh, how what's the it's like uh, journalism schools you go and ask a politician um you're not you're not a child rapist i mean you can't win right once the discussion has started from that point right you're not a pedophile or whatever right like you can't win like he can't really respond the ndp's not no we're not anti-semitic that like that can be that's not now something like David, Rabbi David Mithisar, he obviously, he, he actually just sent me the email. He sent to all the NDP MPs, like pushing back against Sija and he did it, you know, multiple tweets online and, and, and whatever. And I gave independent Jewish voices as, you know, push back. And so, th so that, 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 that is something that, you know, has happened, should happen, more should happen, you know, a public letter from you know, a couple hundred Canadian Jews was challenging Sija's attack against, the NDP, all that kind of stuff I should and, you know, hopefully will, uh, you know, variations of all that happen. Uh, but from from the actual party standpoint, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, you know, you know, no, we're not, you know, no, we're not pedophiles, right? Like, that's a that's a very difficult. Uh, once that's the basis of the discussion, you can't you can't win, right? Like, you're, 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 so well, 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 well one quick, well, one quick follow up, I would just say, you know, politics 101, if you're, you know, if if somebody is smearing you, you just have to call BS into it. Look at how right wingers deal with the press all the time. Every time, like a right winger, and is rightly, you know, called out for being a racist or a xenophobe, they just they just they just stick to their guns and say, "No, I am not. I, I am not a xenophobe." Yeah. Blah blah blah. And then they'll pull out the one example of the one Muslim that wants like a ban on other Muslims coming in. You know. And that's why it's important what Matthew Green did. And I saw that Leah Gazan retweeted Matthew Green because he was direct. You, the usual inclination has been not to be direct, not to call it a smear, to just try to be like, you know, whatever, right? But do understand that Sija is now, and B'nai B'rith or, you know, other Israel lobby groups, they are going to be monitored. I mean, they've been doing it already, but they're going to be taken to a new level. They're going to be monitoring like NDP Facebook groups, NDP this, NDP that, to find something that they can throw back at the party, right? Whether whether it's real, whether it's somebody who, you know, either was, was is actually, you know, anti-Jewish or, or was just sort of being a bit ignorant or, you know, not really thinking things through, or they like, you know, literally manufacture it and, right? And, you know, do it, right? In some NDP phase, yeah. that is gonna be happening. There's absolutely no doubt that, and so if they, and, 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 and you know, anybody who's uh, at all intelligent within the NDP apparatus also understands that even if they are very pro and they know that they're, they gotta be walking on sort of careful because it's not that difficult to manufacture some sort of incident that, that yeah. then you're gonna be like, right? And so that's, that's the reality. And I totally agree that the only way you deal with this is to stand up and just say BS, 
you're the racist, you're the promotion, you're the apartheid yeah. promoting uh, uh, ethnic religious supremacist, uh, uh, you know, and just stand up and say that. And that's what actually, that's what's going to stop the smear campaign, but but that's not where you know our political culture is at. That's certainly not where the end. And, and then and, and and I promise this is just my final question. But but but, but somebody uh, in, in in the audience in the chat said something very interesting with response to uh, with response to you know what's going on in the, in in Iran. Nahid said that if there is any sympathy with Iranian women, please advocate for dropping the sanctions against Iran and demand USA join the Iran nuclear agreement. Otherwise, the current treatment of Iran only empowers the hardliner and festers black market and corrupt economy. Iran moderates would eventually elect, Iran moderates will eventually elect a decent government. So say no to regime change efforts in Iran through foreign intervention, which I completely agree 100%. And that's, uh, yeah, that's my uh, two euros for me. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the Canadian government, we've got to remember, the Canadian government doesn't have diplomatic relations with Iran. The Trudeau government promised to restart diplomatic relations, hasn't, uh, call, uh, labels uh, the Iranian uh, government a state sponsor of terror. That was what the Harper government did, uh, in a series of different sanctions. Uh, you know, the Canadian government has, it's not clearly at the forefront like the US is, but it's taken this this anti-Iranian policy. And, and um you know, again, it's not like I have a lot of sympathy for that, you know, the basic demand of, <laughs> of uh, you know, the idea of, of uh, moral police coming in and saying where this, where that is definitely not a, not a, uh, uh, something that I, you know, am, am keen on, but, but, but let's not, like, let's not remove this uh, protest movement from the, the political uh context in which we all know that it's all it's taking place in which is and if and if canada and if and if canada really and if canada really did care about uh, the uh legitimate some of the legitimate uh, grievances of uh of the iranian feminist movements queer movement and so forth they would also stop selling arms to saudi arabia and stop like giving a green light to what they're doing in Yemen, in Syria, and the fact that you know that that Canada did support both the Mujahideen and later the Taliban. So yeah, <laughs> uh, go go ahead, Laura. Well, I'm just wondering, like in the U.S. now, it's kind of weird because you're finding actually the only ones in Congress and that who are voting against more military aid going to Ukraine are conservatives. Actually, not a single Democrat did. So it's all Republicans. And you see like conservative institutes, well, like Cato Institute, which has always been sort of that way. But so it's a weird it's a weird thing where you act. Their reasons for doing it are different from ours. Their reasons often are they just want us to go get China now or something. So they don't want to digress. But it's a strange thing where you find yourself because it's someone like Max Blumenthal came to someone, a leader of one of the groups I mean, and said, would you ever consider working with them on this one particular issue? Because they're the only ones. It's certainly not getting any Dem supporting, you know, a more restrained position on Ukraine. Um, and so I was just wondering in Canada, with the Conservatives in Canada, are you seeing any of them sort of coming out against this huge... Not, not, not in the MP, not in the House of Commons level, but, but at the level of like the, the far right, like Maxime Bernier oh. is, is uh, uh, <laughs> like Theo Fleury and like um, um, the guy from Rebel News, uh, um, you know the person in charge. People know. I'm sure someone knows the person in charge of Rebel News. But it, but when I did both of my both of my uh, disruptions of uh, the first one of Melanie Jolie and I think the one of Christopher Freeland, uh, the guy from Rebel News and Theo Fleury, Theo Fleury, the former hockey player who is uh, who's like off into the sort of kind of far right world. They both retweeted. They both retweeted the uh, the disruptions. Uh, um, who's somebody? Somebody must know the person from Rebel News. Why am I? Uh, Ezra, Ezra Levant. Levant. Ezra Levant. Yeah, of course. So, uh, Ezra <laughs> Levant. Ezra Levant uh, has has taken that kind of position. But as far as I know, I haven't heard of any conservative MP. Now, probably what explains that is the the the, the most the far, most kind of far right conservative MPs where you would tend to have that type of. Uh, 
dynamic play out. They they're all in the in the Marita, uh, in the um, in the prairies, which also which happens to be the most Ukrainian Canadian, where the Ukrainian Canadian Congress is strongest, right? So that would disincline them towards towards going going that direction, in my guess. Okay. Um, but yeah, no. Okay. Because I was just wondering, the, like, could you ever imagine yourself working with? Well, not the far right. I mean, I just can't even imagine that. But with the people in the Conservative Party who. On every other issue you might disagree with, but just on that, if that, like, yeah, that, that's a really interesting discussion, and, and it is a discussion I think that should be kind of fleshed out a bit more. I, I don't know where I stand and all that. I, I, I like on Twitter. This is a big discussion. I don't know. If I want to get into this whole, but on Twitter there is it's remarkable how many sort of left wing uh, people self described as left wing who spend most of their time attacking anti-imperialists for having associations with what they describe as the far right, Russia today, uh, you know, like, like and, and, and so for instance, um, uh, antiwar.com. I think antiwar.com is a very, very good website. I go to antiwar.com mm -hmm. basically every single day. I think yeah. it's a very, very good summary of sort of global geopolitical affairs. Antiwar.com, I have, you know, I've published articles there. They have, I only send them a certain type of article, you know, the you know, war, obviously war kind of related. Uh, and they don't share my views on, on, you know, I don't know, so on socialism. And in one, one article I sent, I forget what, 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 but they, they cut out a paragraph that kind of went into the more sort of left wing direction. And they kept it more towards the sort of just strictly kind of anti imperialist anti intervention uh, kind of uh, direction. Um, but there's people out there who basically say, because you publish on antiwar.com, you're part of this, like, you know, you're working with these like far right, because like, you know, um, uh, Paul, Rand Paul, or the mm -hmm. The, the yeah. father, or whatever the yeah. son and the father, you know, these they're they're right wing. I don't agree with them on a whole host of of issues, but when it comes to sort of like non interventionist kind of uh, policies, they 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 are unfortunately often better than even the left Democrats. Um, so, uh, so you know, so to me, the anti war .com one is just crazy because I like I think it's you know it's a really good website, and I, again, I don't agree with doesn't mean I agree with everything that's on there, but I think it is a very good website in in in, in international affairs, and um, but then where you know where did where does this line break down on what's you know what's like working with? So there's yeah. people. I mean, let, let let alone actually having a, a joint like meeting where you, you know, had a coalition that included, right? This is just a website where you happen to have an article published and, and they're saying you like, you know, this person should be like banned from the left or because they published their, um, so, so this is actually really, I think quite a fascinating uh, discussion point of how, you know, where, where, where are those lines and all those things? I, I don't really have a, a clear answer. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's lots of people like, um, you know, like Aaron Maté or Max Blumenthal or whatever, where, you know, they've been on uh, like Tucker Carlson of Fox News and, and they get like, you know, shredded for, for, for door. Uh, Greenwall was really attacked for doing that. And I don't, I don't really know the answer to that. And I, like, I understand from the standpoint of the individual and the sort of platform and, you know, wanting to get out to as many people and there's different things you're balancing. It's like, part of me, the, yeah. This, so how do you, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, that some of those questions, but um, my inclination would be that if it's a, uh, you know, short term clear that it's about like, you know, one issue uh, it's one action about one issue, you know, I don't know how far right you would go. I'd be prepared to go with in an, in an, an alliance, but, but that my inclination is you would, do that as understood as part of like we you know we're not yeah but um uh and hello eve hello everybody thank you so much um i'll try to be really brief um i just uh, wondered if you i know you always emphasize that you're focusing on the canadian uh approach to foreign policy do you have any comments on the Italian election, though? Um, I'm, I guess, 
horrified that it comes on the anniversary that it does virtually. And um, just wonder if you've had any time to think about that in particular. No, really, yeah. I haven't followed much. I, I listened to a, a clip about, an uh, interesting clip about um, on Democracy Now! today, um, but I, I, I don't, no, I I don't, have, I I don't yeah. have any uh, particular uh, insight on that issue. She sounds like she's, you know, she's got a real sort of like street fighting fascist background to her. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> like, like, so, but I, I don't, I don't know anything more than that really. Okay. Well, one thing that um, in the years that I've tried to find out a little bit more about, you know, the history of Zionism um, is that uh, Netanyahu's father was a secretary to Yabotinsky, who was affiliated with Mussolini. And Yabotinsky's name, a Russian Jew, is um, remembered in streets in Jerusalem, apparently in dozens of places. And anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, but horrible connections, actually. Thank you so much, as always, for your work. I'm looking forward to getting your book. Thank you. Uh, Nahid, did you still have a comment or question? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I guess um, just to say that, you know, my background is uh, from Iran. So I have some insights into the current situation in Iran. So uh, thanks for the support, Yuri. Um, and then Eves, when you said, uh, um, you know, how to respond in relation to Ukraine, even if the message comes from far right or libertarian or whatnot, I think some issues are so fundamentally big that that one really have no other choice that uh, get any alliance or support that we can. And that is the Ukrainian situation. And that is where the whole world is at risk. It's not just one party or group or... Uh, so I think if uh, someone says something about Ukraine that really makes sense, um, you know, joining uh, and supporting that while stating that you are not selling your soul or, or your ideology or what that is, is not that you're aligning yourself, but it's just that is the right thing to do because the issue of humanity, uh, I don't think we have been closer to the rest of nuclear war as it just seems getting more and more uh, escalated. And, uh, um, and also I was listening to uh, a YouTube uh, by Yanis, can't say the last name, he's the economist from Greece. And then he was saying actually this uh, sanction against uh, Russia, uh, it only enriching all the oligarchs of Europe and, and, and Russia and has, and obviously has brought misery uh, to, to the economic situation uh, of the Europeans. Uh, like someone from Belgium was saying that, you know, 40% of uh, Belgians are getting to the poverty level. And that was really describing how uh, the rigged system of uh, the current energy has nothing to do with supply it's all to do with the profits, um, financial profits at the production level and uh, at the retail le level. But it's not that the resource, there is a scarcity. Um, obviously, I'm not an economist. I cannot uh, explain that well. I, I will put that YouTube uh, interview, uh, very informative about really understanding where we are going. Um, and so 
to me, Ukraine situation, I think any alliance one can get to strengthen that message that the people, the public, the group, uh, parties, uh, intellectuals, uh, right, left, women, but not, they are for finding solution as demanding uh, a resolution. So when or country or officials say, no, this is not the right time to negotiate. What are they talking about? How many need to, to be killed? How much more money need we need to spend to escalate? Thanks for listening. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, and I agree with the, I mean, I agree with obviously the, it's crazy if you look at how many times the Canadian government officials have boasted about sending weapons and other kind of militaristic elements and then how many times they've ever said anything about negotiations it's like literally well most of what they said about negotiations is we will not negotiate some variation of that or it's not we have to punish putin but what it is now. so yeah and that and i agree with that the point on on the on the on uh, with regards to the right and and you know the question of of um uh, nuclear uh, armageddon that is in the background of this uh escalatory process in in the Ukraine is um, does mean that you know you've got to if there's who, you know whoever is opposing uh, try to work with with that uh, I think that that broadly uh, I'm in broad agreement with that um, Dan uh, go ahead uh, hi thanks thanks for uh, having me um, I was gonna ask uh, what do you think? Um, I, I also I'm, I was out of the room for a moment a while back, so maybe you've already talked about this. But uh, what is your position on the referendum that Russia is holding with the uh, four uh, regions uh, that they control in Ukraine? And um, do you think that it would be possible? Like this is a hypothetical that I kind of thought of that if you were to have a hold hold the hold the referendum which they're doing right now which you know for lack of better terms could be just a um you know a foregone conclusion but would it be possible to say like this, this this is what putin could potentially just like this is as much as he could get for land since he's called up all those troops so do you think it would be possible if they were to have a, a ceasefire now and then have maybe a neutral party hold the referendum again in like say six months, a year. And then uh, that, and if, if that would have happened, like, do you think the world would buy it? Say if a neutral party say, say Mexico stepped in and said, hey, we'll, we'll take over and uh, uh, control, like have the referendum. And then if you don't like, and if the, the and, and We'll be the and we'll have the results. And if you don't believe us, then well, shrug. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you had your uh, your thoughts on that at all. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, my sense my sense is that I mean, I'm not I'm not a, a lawyer and certainly not any expert in international law. Uh, but under having referendum in this context is is a violation of international law, as I understand it. Now, I did see a tweet from. Um, the uh, special rapporteur on sanctions, um, Yuri, I'm sure you know, you had him on not long ago, uh, I'm forgetting his name right now, uh, uh, where he was basically saying that eight years ago to have had a referendum in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk would, would have been a violation of, uh, of international law, but, but after eight years of, of uh, Ukrainian uh, violence that it would be legitimate. I don't. I don't know. It, it. 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 It doesn't. To me, it doesn't. Doesn't pass the, the sort of sniff test to have a to have a referendum in this context. It seems clear that you can't have proper. You know, certainly that quick of a referendum, and you know, to have a legitimate uh, referendum in this context seems um, hard to hard to hard to believe. Uh, I do believe that the people. I think in Luhansk and Donetsk, at least. Probably people. My guess is that people do want to join Russia, and and uh, probably a fairly significant, uh, you know, a solid majority do. That's my that's my guess, and then would be based upon uh, the fact that 
you know, after eight years, uh, the fact that the people who didn't want to join Russia mostly have left, uh, the fact that they just want an end to the fighting and, and the understanding that the most likely way to end uh, fighting would be if they just become part of Russia and that's going to be the, the protector. That's, that's my guess. I don't know about the other regions, uh, if, that's, if that holds as, 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 as strongly. Um, uh, I know that um, the professor that I had on, uh, who'd actually done some polling on the question, he had, he, he had uh, before, before 2014, he showed that most people didn't actually want to join Russia. There was lots of sympathy for Russia, but they wouldn't, wouldn't actually have wanted to join Russia and you know, be questions about being independent. And, um, so, so I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know like, you know, what, uh, um, what that, you know, what that leads to and the idea of, you know, having a, you know, a, a new referendum in a year or some period of time, not that far down the road, that's under better conditions. Uh, uh, I have to say I, I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty uh, pessimistic about where this is sort of all going and uh, and uh, it just it look, I really feel both sides are just they're just ramping up and they're ramping up and they're ramping up and how do you how do you get out of that like I don't I don't think the Russian government wanted to go to do this right away this is the Russian government's response to uh, the extent of NATO involvement and things not going that well in some elements of what they were trying to, to do. Um, and so once you've had these referendums and once you uh, incorporate these territories into Russia, like how do you, how do you walk, walk that back? And then, so, you know, I just, I just see this, the process continuing on of, of, of more and more escalation. And, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, at, at, at some level, I kind of feel like it's like there, there's a, just a denial in the, you know, Ottawa and Washington, London, that, you know, Russia's going to be on its, Russia's going to be on Ukraine's border. For, <laughs> like, it's, it's there, right? Like, like, this is, that's not changing, right? So uh, you can say, you can, you can complain all you want about this or that about Russia. And some of it, I agree with it. Some of it's, exaggerated some of it's incorrect but that you know it is a country that has you know it's a big country that is views itself in a certain way that's on that that is there and and like our our security concerns are not as legitimate as russia's security concerns in ukraine they just clearly are not geographically that's craziness to even like think that um and uh but 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 uh, you know there isn't there isn't there isn't opposition, right? You know the um, the president's uh, Biden's spokesperson was asked some question of I think it was Biden's spokesperson saying, you know, can we just keep doing this? Of, you know, a new billion dollars of weapons every week or whatever, and he was like, yeah, we're not really. Congress is all on board. The Senate's on board. We're just we're not feeling we're not feeling the heat domestically. Uh, you know, they, I think they're calibrating, they are calibrating, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Russia and, you know, some other sort of global calibration, but not in terms of domestic, really, uh, you know, political kind of dynamics. Hopefully that can change and, you know, it can change, we know it can change, but we're not seeing that play out, right? We're not seeing anti-war forces and saying, you know, let's, let's go in a different direction. Um, so, well, Alfred Desaias, uh, uh, yeah. uh, Eve, uh, Alfred Desaias, I think that I think that's the name that you were, uh, yeah, uh, who, who's who's been on my program several times. You know, he, I mean, he basically had the position that you've that you've been having in in, in your several articles covering Ukraine and Russia. That that listen, uh, he, he said he said that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was illegal, but the fact of the matter is Russia was more or less either uh, either provoked or, or or the Russians felt that they had no choice but to respond militarily due to constant uh, Western meddling into Ukraine and having a hostile neighbor and stuff like that. And the fact of the matter is, just like Afghanistan and just like Syria, where we're supporting the most reactionary movements in Ukraine, we supported the most reactionary ultra-ethno-nationalist movements and, and all of those supposedly well-meaning you know 
Eastern European civil society groups like the Ukrainian Canadian Congress and whatnot. These are all groups that were founded by runaway Nazis who continue to lionize Nazi collaborators and Nazi war criminals. That's where Freeland's grandfather and her father, you know, hail from. So that's that said, yeah, I also don't I also don't yeah, I also think that like, yeah, that the Russian invasion was also a bit counterproductive, but uh, again, that's the problem with you know when it comes to Western meddling. But I also just wanted to quickly respond to to, uh, to your thing about you know working at times with you know the rights when it comes to you know anti-imperialist uh, issues of the day. Uh, yeah, you know there was there was a time where, where where the late Alexander Coburn of you know Counterpunch was a big advocate of working with libertarians when it came to ending the drug war, certain anti-war issues that they felt strongly about. And I still, to, a, to an extent, I still kind of, you know, even believe in that. That's why I thought it was, I thought it was nice that Tulsi Gabbard would go out of her way to go on Fox News, to go to military communities, go to right-wing communities and talk to them about anti-war issues. And then she would also even end up converting them into supporting single payer health care and government involvement and just uh, uh, causes. Uh, I, 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 you know, my only problem is, is when, uh, is when left minded people start to adopt grotesque right wing positions like, you know, COVID minimalism or COVID denialism or start to, st or start to bitterly complain about identity uh, politics, which unfortunately that has happened with Tulsi Gabbard that happened with a lot on the left who supported uh, Brexit, but but, uh, but but no, but I'm I'm completely fine with working with people if 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 it's about ending the drug war, if it is about you know advancing you know minority rights, I'm completely for that. And curious where the Libertarian Party of Canada stands then on most of these anti-war issues, because we do have a Libertarian movement led by Ron Paul, which is still better opposing wars on, on on a good day than AOC is <laughs> so yeah yeah I I the, the, the dynamic that goes on in the U.S. on these issues is much less clear-cut in Canada because there isn't really a uh there isn't as much of a of a kind of right-wing force that that takes a non-interventionist kind of uh, uh policy and 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 I think that we have to be honest with the you know the U.S. empire is the biggest problem in the world right and so you know non-interventionist kind of politics just take in my opinion it, it just you really shouldn't be able to talk about anything in American politics without talking about less military spending or less bases overseas or less right it's just such as the scale is just so uh, uh, gigantic um, so to prioritize kind of a non-interventionist kind of thing in my opinion makes you know makes significantly more sense in the US but uh, but it's a big it's a big debate and, and um, uh, it would be interesting I actually think at some point to have uh, have that debate uh, kind of played out in a in a, in a you know have have the debate and with one or two people representing both sides and uh, maybe on 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 the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour or maybe some other uh, some other platform uh, to have that. But uh, we're past uh, seven o'clock, so um, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming out, and uh, uh, next week uh, same same place, uh, same time. Thanks everyone. Take care. Ours to the people. Death to the warmongers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.